Hello, welcome to another video. So we'll take the derivative of arc cosecant of x from first principles. And I already wrote the formula we typically use. I'm just going to walk through whatever we need to do to get what we want. And at the end of the day, we'll get our answer. So let's not waste time. Let's get straight into it. The first thing as usual to do is to replace this because you don't know any trig identity you can, you're going to use to expand this. So why don't we replace it and then take it to the region where we're comfortable. So the first thing is we're going to say um, let, I'm going to say let A be equal to cosecant inverse of X plus H. Okay, that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to say then that if I take the cosecant of A, then I'm also taking the cosecant of inverse cosecant, you see that, of X plus H. So I'm taking the inverse cosecant of both sides, and that tells me that cosecant of A is equal to X plus H. Nice. And I can replace this also. So I can say also, or similarly, similarly, I can say, um, let, um, in fact, let's do this. I can say, put it here, B equals cosecant inverse of X. So that if I take the cosecant of this, I'm going to be writing cosecant B here, and then undoing this, and I just have X. So I can say, I can have X here, and here I can write cosecant B. So here I have cosecant A, and here I have cosecant B, and that means I can subtract this from this because I want to isolate H. So, so what we say, I can do it this way. This implies that H equals cosecant A minus cosecant B. Cosecant A minus cosecant B. And I think I'm done. And based on what I've explained, the inverse trig functions are one-to-one -one functions. Okay? Which means, it be, the fact that it's an inverse means it's a one-to-one -one function because for a function to be invertible, it has to be one-to-one, -one, which simply means that if cosecant A becomes cosecant B, it simply means A becomes B. And from previous examples that I've shown you, you can see the following are true. As H approaches zero, which is what we have here, the following are true. Number one, we know that this will approach zero, okay? If this goes to zero, the right-hand side goes to zero, and this right-hand side only goes to zero if cosecant A goes to cosecant B, okay? Uh, implies cosecant A goes to cosecant B, or A goes to B, okay? or a minus b goes to zero. So I'm, I'm just gonna stick with these two, okay? Whichever you choose in this case will work, but I'm gonna choose this. Instead of writing as h goes to zero, I'm gonna say as a goes to b. That's a simplified form. So now, let's go back to this and rewrite this expression. So this expression is gonna be f prime of x is equal to the limit. So me, instead of writing h goes to zero, I'm gonna write as a goes to b as A goes to B is going to be this. We said this is A, so I'm going to write A minus this. We said let it be B, and then divided by what's under H. We said H is cosecant A minus cosecant B, cosecant A minus cosecant B. So at this point, it looks like everything is looking great. Except that cosecant A can be written as 1 over sine A, and this is 1 over sine B. So let's write it one more time. So this is equal to the limit as A goes to B of A minus B divided by 1 over sine A minus 1 over sine B. Now, I can rewrite this expression. 1 over sine A minus 1 over sine B can be written as 
sine B minus sine A over sine A sine B. And the sine A sine B can go up. So if you simplify this expression, this is the limit as A approaches B of A minus B times sine A sine B over sine B minus sine A. Now, this is where it gets beautiful because I'm trying to, I don't know, what is this? Oh, well, I want it to be sine A minus sine B, so I can undo this by putting a minus sign, okay? So I can, if I factor out a minus sign, this becomes sine A minus sine B. Okay, let's rewrite this. So this is gonna be with a minus sign, um, the limit as A goes to B of A minus B sine A, sine B, divided by negative with parenthesis, then I have sine A minus sine B. Okay, it's beginning to look like what I want it to be. Okay, now what is the next and most important move? It is to replace sine A minus sine B by an identity we know, because there's an identity for sine A minus sine B. So we can replace this bottom part here. So this is the same thing as the limit as A goes to B of, we have A minus B, sine A, sine B, divided by, see this bottom part, see this minus sign, I can actually bring it here, because doesn't matter. Put the negative here, so I, I, I know it's, it's in the back there. Sine A minus B is the same thing as 2 cosine A plus B over 2 times sine A minus B over 2. Remember, if you, forget, if you don't remember these, just go back to your simple double angle identity, and then from there you can build up until you get to this point. So this is what I'm looking for, because I'm looking for a situation where I can use the trig identity um, and the limits too that we've known about sine. You see, if I can produce something that looks like this up here, and then put it on top of this, it's gonna go to one as a minus b over two goes to zero. Remember that a minus b will go to zero. So we could have written this as A, or is the same thing as A minus B goes to zero. This is the same thing as this, because if you move this over here, you have zero left. So if this goes to zero, this also goes to zero, but this has to look exactly as this. So what I'm going to do in one move is, I'm going to divide this by two, okay? Maybe I should do it, take one more step. So this is gonna be equal to the limit as A goes to B of, this is gonna be written as, watch this, two times A minus B over two. Do you see that? This is still the same thing as this, because this two will cancel out, I still have my A minus B, but I'm going to place this under it directly, so it's gonna look like this, and this two, I'm gonna put it here too. And so that what I have is gonna be sine A minus B over two. And then I'm gonna multiply by sine A sine B, sine A sine B divided by, what's the other part left? Cosine A plus B over two. Cosine A plus B over two. Okay, now I'm done. All of this can be canceled out so that what I have is minus the limit as A approaches B of, now if we cancel this out, what I have left is just A minus B over two divided by sine A minus B over two times sine A sine B, this is just redundant because I didn't make any difference other than canceling out the twos, <laughs> But let's just go A plus B over two. Okay, so what do we get? This goes to one, okay? This goes to one, this limit goes to one, and what is left here? If we take the limit of this part too, as A goes to B, sine A goes to sine B. So this becomes sine B 
times sine b, which is equal to sine squared b. And this becomes, as a goes to b, a becomes b. What is b plus b is 2b. 2b over 2 is just b, cosine b. And this is a, oh, there's a minus sign with a minus sign. So this is the answer. We just need to write it in terms of x. That's it. So if we construct a triangle, let's put the triangle here. Let's make a small triangle here. Okay, see this is our triangle. And this is the angle B. But from the beginning, we know that cosecant B is equal to X. Cosecant, remember, is hypotenuse over opposite. Okay, so it's X over one. So this is gonna be X, this is one, and this is the square root of X squared minus one. So we can obtain all of these here. So what is sine B? Sine B is one opposite of hypotenuse, which is one over X. And when you square it is one over X squared. So this is minus one over X squared divided by what's, what's down here. It's going to be cosine B is adjacent over hypotenuse, which is the square root of X squared minus one divided by X. And as you can see, if you want to get rid of the two denominators, multiply by the LCD, and you notice you multiply this by x squared, multiply this by x squared, your answer is going to be negative. Only one remains on top. If you multiply the bottom by x squared, there's going to be one x left here, and it's going to be x times the square root of x squared minus 1. You could have used trig identities, but I just wanted to make it simple because I was running out of space. Well, this is what you get. However, remember that there are restrictions. Firstly, for this to be defined, you can't get a zero in the denominator. So definitely x cannot be zero and x cannot be any value such that the square of it will still be less than one. So x must be a value that is far away from zero, at least by something great, slightly more than one. Okay, so the absolute value, we have to say that the absolute value of x must be greater than one. So whether it's negative or positive, it has to be a value that is either negative one point something or positive one point something. But it cannot be one and it cannot be less than one. And the second point is it cannot be a negative number. Why? Because the shape of this graph has a slope that's always negative. And because we have a permanent negative here, whatever is produced in this fraction or in this rational expression must always be positive to maintain the negative. So this is always positive, okay? Because this number will be greater than one and then you get a positive. So this two must be positive. So we put the absolute value sign beside it and this is it. Never stop learning. Those who stop learning have stopped living. Bye-bye.